whereas the Egyptians considered it sacred. There's one thing we know about ancient Egypt for certainty, is that they observed the star Sirius. And we are sure when they speak of that star. Everything that comes out of the ancient world has to have a spiritual and metaphysical base. The ancients and the ancient Egyptians in particular, but probably ancient civilizations more generally, saw themselves, humanity, us, as tied in with the bigger environment, the cosmos, the bigger picture. Uh, they built monuments and they aligned them. Uh, but what for? And do their belief systems uh, have validity today? If we want to decode Egyptian symbolism, we should look for clues in the ancient language that Hakim learned as a child from his elders, living along the Band of Peace. Looking at the many images left by the Egyptians, we have assumed that they were obsessed with death. Turning to the ancient Suf language, however, we learn that they didn't even have a word for death. They called it Westing. We have no word death in our culture. No word death. And uh, to express this operation of <laughs> this we say westing uh, you know like go going towards west like the sun rises from the east and westing so there is no uh, word death here we well, believe in resurrection if the sun sets in the west the resurrection happens in the next day when the sun rises in the next day so the deceased believe that it's just like the sun the Egyptians obviously had a very different worldview from ours today. They believed in the afterlife and the soul's immortality. Was it possible at all that they had found some sort of science of immortality, for example, we call it, as crazy as it may seem, uh, they seemed to be very, very convinced that they knew how to send the king to his cosmic world those stellar gods uh, of whom the king believed that he himself would become one stellar god after his death, constructed monuments and performed rituals that mimic the events that they saw in the sky. It sounds against all the tenets of our scientific beliefs, but we have to see why they were so convinced. The ancient Egyptians perceived the land as a cosmic environment, that it followed the activities of the sky because they believed them to be uh, running in parallel. And they had reasons to believe that. Uh, one of the main reasons was the cycles of the Nile. The Nile was the lifeblood of Egypt and it performed the cycle, which followed the cycle of the sun and the stars. It's not surprising at all that they associated the, the reappearance of the stars with the rebirth of the Nile. Essentially, this, this star religion, if you like, boiled down to one important aspect, that it somehow could help the king become a spiritual being and return to the cosmic world in a specific place with Orion and, and so forth. How they thought they were going to do it is by looking very, very carefully at what happened to the stars. And the stars perform an annual cycle. But those of Sirius and Orion give us a curious cycle in that they disappear or they appear to disappear. But if you watch a star over the course of the year, you'll find that there comes a time when it is very low in the west at time of sunset. So the sun sets and as it gets dark the star appears just for a few seconds over the west. If you come the next day you will not see that star. And for 70 days or so the star has gone. It seems to have gone under the earth. But after those 70 days it appears by this time at dawn rising just before the sun which we call the heliacal rising. 
what is the Egyptian call it, the rebirth of the star. So in their mind, something happened. In their mind, the star went in the underworld, stayed in the underworld for 70 days, and then by magic, popped up again, was reborn again in the East. That's the pyramid text. The pyramid text mimic the site. At the ancient site of Saqqara, we find the pyramid texts, the oldest known religious texts in the world. Covering the inner walls of these small pyramids are thousands of hieroglyphs showing knowledge of celestial mechanics and cycles of time. Although we've come a long way in our understanding of hieroglyphs, it is possible that many layers of meaning in the symbols remain hidden until now. When we approach hieroglyphics, we do so from our own point of view, and we assume that the letters of our alphabet correspond with certain hieroglyphs. There are 4,000 Egyptian hieroglyphs, but only 26 letters. In order to crack the code, we need to open our minds to different levels of meaning. I think it's just familiarity with the way modern languages work. No one expects that a word would work differently. Our, our mindset is that a letter is the carrier of a phonetic value and that a word is the carrier of a concept. To understand the Egyptian words, you have to start from the approach that the letter is the carrier of the concept and the word is an extended sentence. There are nuances of meanings to the words um, that you don't get if you don't understand what the individual glyphs mean. Um, for instance, there's an Egyptian word that is translated as diving duck. But when you read the glyphs, it really reads pool of water, place of diving duck. In 1822, French scholar Jean-Francois Champollion and British scientist Thomas Young deciphered the hieroglyphics from the Rosetta Stone. The stone was created in 196 BC. It showed the same text in hieroglyphic, Greek and Demotic Egyptian on the one tablet. Scholars have used Champollion's translations as the basis for deciphering hieroglyphs. Could Champollion have missed subtleties? or even withheld some information. One biographical study of Champollion said that he delayed for a very long period of time before producing his translation because in the words of the, the study, um, he clung stubbornly to the idea that an Egyptian glyph might mean something more than just a phonetic guy. Laird Scranton is a computer software engineer who has interpreted a new aspect of hieroglyphics. His research is revolutionizing the way hieroglyphic is understood. Basically, Egyptian hieroglyphic words work more like an acronym in English, um, like the phrase FYI or an acronym such as CIA or CBS, where anyone who reads English understands that you don't try to pronounce this word. This is not a word that you're going to read for its meaning in terms of the letters all put together. It's one letter at a time, stands for one word at a time, and you put the words together to get the meaning. If we think of each hieroglyphic word as an acronym, rather than having a phonetic value, a new layer of interpretation appears. Hieroglyphs reveal in symbolic terms the way the ancient Egyptians thought the universe works. I can show that certain key glyph shapes came out of cosmology, which describes how the universe was created. Okay, and because the shapes came out of cosmology, it makes sense that the meanings that attach to the shape are associated with cosmology also. They would have meanings related to the creation of the universe. Once you agree that the sun glyph means what it means, and that's all traditional meanings, it's hard to argue that the word month doesn't say the moon makes an, an orbit. Or it's hard to argue that the word year doesn't say time of the Earth's orbit around the sun. The 
the ancient Egyptians were almost obsessive keepers of records. And one thing that they observed most was the celestial objects. We'd expect them to pay attention and record. Now, how far back? That's a big question. Well, we now have some sites that go at least six or seven thousand years before. There's a megalithic site that has been found in, in the early 70s, uh, but not understood until lately, uh, that has astronomical alignments. And strangely, the astronomical alignments that it has are precisely the ones you find in the Pyramid Age, so called Orion, Sirius, the summer sources, they're all there. It's no more theory. We have evidence that they did it. <laughs> For decades, author Robert Boval has been studying the alignment of Egyptian monuments to key stars. Mohammed Shukba. We've come here, and what we're trying to do is get to the Naptaplai. Yeah. The most important thing is we get there. Yeah. He is now planning an expedition across the desert to a site called Nabta Playa, a hundred kilometers west of the Nile and 30 kilometers north of the Sudanese border. It is the location of Egypt's oldest astronomical measuring device. And when we're there, how do you know we're there? Uh, it's all desert. Yes, it's desert. Every, every place here in Western desert, I know it. If you can, then we're going to need a GPS. Yeah. If you can yeah. get one. Yes, I have one. That, that, that makes me feel a lot happier. The team finds out that permits from Cairo have been delayed. Now we wait. You tell us we wait for yeah. the answer from Cairo. And so in the meanwhile, <clears throat> let's go and see the sites. Let's go and see some of the temples here. Yeah? Okay. Let's do it. The key to decoding Egypt is in the alignments of the temples which changed in different epochs to match the majestic drift of the procession of the stars. We're now here at the Karnak Temple in Luxor. Uh, on this wall we can see the ritual of the stretching of the cord. On the right hand side is the goddess Seshet, represented by a priestess. She's holding a rod and a mallet. And on the other side is the pharaoh. There's a cord.